All right, we'll go ahead and start. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, A History of Zoning and Segregation in Virginia, Lessons for Today. I am Eric Maribojic, the Director of the Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship at the George Mason University School of Business. The issues Virginia faces today regarding housing affordability and access to adequate housing are not just the results of market forces, but our history of zoning played a role in shaping the way housing in our urban and suburban neighborhoods look and function today. Thank you for joining us this evening with the Better uh, Business for a Better World Center and the Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship for a discussion of the historic roots of housing inequities and the opportunities for change based on the recent zoning and segregation in Virginia report from the law firm of McGuire Woods. First, for some introductory remarks, I'd like to present the Dean of the George Mason School of Business, Maury Piper. Thanks very much, Eric, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, this evening for this essential topic that uh, could not be more central to uh, the future of our region and indeed uh, our society and certainly our university. Mason is the largest university in Virginia. School of Business is the largest business school in Virginia, over 5,000 students of all types from all backgrounds. And one of the crucial things that we strive to do is to provide opportunity and access to people who may not have had it before, people who come from backgrounds where it has made, made it harder for them to achieve economic uh, independence, to access higher education. And it turns out that all these forces are interconnected. And I'm particularly proud that a number of entities around Mason have come together First of all, to put the Earth Month series together, that's uh, our um, Office of Sustainability, our Institute for Sustainable Earth. And they partner now for this event, in particular with our Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship, of which Eric's the Executive Director, uh, and our Business for a Better World Center, of which the Co-Executive Directors, Anne Magro and Lisa Green Pemble, are here with us. The idea is that we are a school that wants to have not just education, but also impact in the wider uh, society and to develop thoughtful, future-oriented business leaders who figure out how to solve key problems of our age. And I would venture to say that uh, affordability of housing uh, and the history of zoning that we're gonna talk about tonight are contributors to some of the key problems of our age. So I just wanna thank all the people that have come together to uh, create this webinar. I want to thank our partners at McGuire Woods, who wrote the paper on the history of zoning and segregation in Virginia. It's a great example of a company uh, addressing issues of social inequity that they themselves encountered, as many of us have encountered, simply in the course of doing business. And I'll just end by saying that as a, as a native of the Washington area, born in D.C., grew up in Maryland, I left for 30 plus years, and now here I am back in Virginia. It is just fascinating to see how this has evolved. And as Eric says, it has not been a market thing. It has been just as much uh, about restricted markets, even more than about uh, open markets. I'll be fascinated to hear how the discussion goes. Thank you all uh, for being here. And I look forward to uh, hearing our panel. Thank you, Maury. And now I'd like to introduce the Business for a Better World Center, the co-host of this program and its co-director, Lisa Gring Pemble. Good afternoon and welcome. Our center, our Business for a Better World Center, envisions a world where business is a force for good, leading the change to address the world's most pressing problems. We recognize the imperative to educate future business leaders for a better world. Our center wants to partner with businesses and organizations to move the needle on transformative social and environmental change by rethinking the way we educate students. Partnering with folks like the Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship and McGuire Woods is essential to our mission. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lisa. The Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship is the other co-host tonight. Uh, the center is Mason's platform for supporting real estate education and a forum for topics on development and the built environment. Uh, 
I'd like to take a moment to thank the leading real estate companies and organizations who form our advisory board. Uh, these companies provide the financial support and guidance that allow us to produce educational programs like the one we're having this evening. So a few reminders for our audience, this program is being recorded and a link will be emailed to all registrants, hopefully by tomorrow. If you are attending for education credits for the American Institute of Architects, please send me an email after the event to confirm your attendance. Our thanks to the AIA Virginia for this benefit. The agenda tonight will be a presentation from our featured speaker, followed by a reaction panel. We will then have a moderated question and answer period. The event will end with a short video courtesy of our friends from the Alliance for Housing Solutions on the history of zoning and, and segregation as experienced by one of our communities here in Northern Virginia. As right, so a reminder, please use the Q&A button on your screen to write questions for any of our speakers. Our featured speaker tonight is Jonathan Rock. Jonathan is a partner with McGuire Woods and the former manager of the firm's Tyson's office. He has practiced law in Northern Virginia for more than 25 years and devotes a significant portion of his practice to land use, utility matters, and representing landowners seeking regulatory approvals to develop property. I turn the screen now over to Jonathan. Thank you, Eric. I am <clears throat> having a little bit of a glitch with my uh, with my screens here, but I should be able to uh, figure this out in just a second. There we go. <clears throat> Well, again, thank you very much to George Mason University for hosting this uh, webinar this evening. We, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to engage with you and, and with the audience uh, via the, the webinar. And thank you for the New York Times for this headline, uh, which uh, came out just uh, about 10 days ago, um, which I think summarizes what we're talking about today and, and why we have an interest in this with the tagline, if you care about social justice, you have to care about zoning. Who, who, who would have thought about that two, three, four years ago? Um, but I think that uh, what we found is that there is a direct link. So my personal involvement in this issue uh, started with a Facebook post, ironically. I've been a zoning lawyer for actually over 35 years in Northern Virginia. And I've occasionally encountered racism at several zoning hearings, but I never really understood the fundamental connection between zoning and racial segregation until about a year ago. And I was uh, looking at the Facebook feed of Alexandria's Mayor Justin Wilson, who's one of our more uh, thoughtful, uh, uh, he calls himself a policy geek, but uh, uh, one of our more thoughtful elected officials. And he had posted a video summarizing Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, which some of you have, have probably read. And in this eight minute video, Rothstein brilliantly explains the thesis of his book that de facto segregation, that is that we just choose to live in separate neighborhoods and it's just sort of a natural type of thing, is a myth. And that the concerted actions at every level of government over the, particularly over the 20th century, have intentionally segregated where we live. <clears throat> Prompted by that video, uh, I, I went ahead and read The Color of Law, which was an excellent book, certainly highly recommend it to everybody, along with a group of my colleagues at McGuire Woods, and started as a book discussion group and basically evolved into what we creatively have named the Zoning and Segregation Working Group. So this is a group of zoning and real estate lawyers, land use planners, and government relations consultants 
And although we come from Virginia's largest law firm and typically represent a wide range of business clients, we are not doing this work on behalf of any client or, or interest group. This is strictly a pro bono effort attempting to frankly pursue racial justice. And I feel very, very lucky to be part of this team. There's some extremely talented individuals. There are people who have experienced the effects of zoning, and I'm sorry, um, racial discrimination firsthand, which helps inform our, our work. This is, I think, somewhat unusual for a big law firm, particularly one focused on, on business interests. But we have been encouraged and inspired to involve ourselves in issues of racial justice by our firm leadership, especially our chairman, John Harmon. As a child, uh, John witnessed a cross burning um, across the street from his home in a Long Island, New York suburb. This crude attempt to force black families out of a white neighborhood fortunately didn't work but it is emblematic of the issues that our group is working to remedy. So our group has been meeting weekly uh, since last summer. We uh, have invited different speakers in. Uh, we have uh, topics presented at each, each weekly meeting. And we wrote this study paper, which we released in February. And in it, we focus on describing the connections between zoning and segregation and we've in, intentionally delayed offering any remedies until we complete a part two paper, which we're expecting later this summer. Hopefully we're smart enough to know how much we don't know about this topic. And we recognize that there are many perspectives to learn from, including from public sector planning officials, from racial justice advocates, such as the NAACP and Black Lives Matter, from academics, from business groups, um, and also certainly from elected officials. So this webinar is really part of our learning process and we're very eager to hear from you. So the agenda for my presentation is up on the screen. <clears throat> We'd like to take a few minutes of your time to go through this, particularly providing some background on the history of zoning and segregation in Virginia. And then we very much look forward both to the panel discussion and to your questions and your comments. Let's start with the first zoning laws that were adopted in Virginia. The very first zoning laws in Virginia were in fact racial segregation laws that divided up the blocks of Richmond and Ashland, Virginia into colored, quote, colored and white zones. If the majority of people living on the block were white, then blacks couldn't move in or live there. And if the majority of the people on a block were black, then vice versa, whites couldn't move in. This uh, racial zoning in Ashland uh, has a very interesting backstory. Richmond had in 1911 very recently enacted its segregation ordinance when the daughter of a deceased Methodist minister and college professor started a rumor in Ashland that Booker T. Washington was going to replicate the Tuskegee Institute, which he had founded in Alabama, and move it, or at least a branch of it, to Ashland on land that this um, woman had inherited. It was happened to be directly across the street from the Randolph-Macon campus. In the frenzy uh, to stop this, the town council literally copied Richmond's segregation ordinance. And ironically, it turns out that Booker T. Washington had never contemplated any such move, never even thought about establishing a new campus in Virginia, uh, which he, he responded to some articles, uh, newspaper articles explaining that he had nothing to do with this. So it makes one wonder what Mrs. Pierce's motivation, she's the one who spread this rumor, uh, really was. Maybe it was to increase the value of her property, but We'll never know. Nevertheless, the town of uh, Ashland began enforcing the law and fined John Coleman, a black entrepreneur who bought a house on a white block near Randolph-Macon College. Uh, it's actually interesting that uh, Coleman's um, great grandnephew, I guess, 
is depicted in this uh, photograph in front of the hotel building that Coleman also had owned. Coleman hired a lawyer who coincidentally was also serving on the town council and happened to have voted for the ordinance to defend him. The circuit court uh, upheld the law in this challenge, uh, which was appealed along with the Richmond ordinance to the Virginia Supreme Court. And I guess not surprisingly, given the era, the Virginia Supreme Court found that the ordinance was a reasonable exercise of the police power and did not violate the 14th Amendment. These racial zoning ordinances spread around the Commonwealth. You can see on this map uh, as far west as Roanoke and up into our backyard in Falls Church. Interestingly, and I'm still trying to get a copy of some of the original records, but my understanding from secondary sources is that the Falls Church ordinance, racial zoning ordinance, actually adopted essentially a zoning map um, in 1915 that um, divided up the entire city of Falls Church into areas where African Americans could live, of course, a very small area, and areas where whites could live. As I mentioned, the Virginia Supreme Court upheld this residential segregation ordinance in the case of Hopkins versus City of Richmond in 1915. But only two years later in 1917, the US Supreme Court struck down a Louisville, Kentucky segregation ordinance that was virtually identical to the Richmond and Ashland ordinances. And this appeal um, came really uh, based on the efforts of the um, newly energetic uh, informed NAACP and was one of the few successes in uh, challenging these Jim Crow era laws. Uh, that case was uh, the Buchanan versus Worley case. Because of other US Supreme Court rulings that upheld zoning for other purposes, which I'm gonna talk about next, Richmond leaders thought that if they adopted a zoning ordinance that was one step removed from segregating blacks and whites, that it would survive a constitutional challenge. So in 1929, they adopted a zoning ordinance that segregated people based on whether they could marry each other. And of course, as you may know, uh, the Virginia General Assembly had adopted uh, the so-called racial integrity law, which prohibited uh, African Americans and white Americans from marrying each other. This was the same law that was finally uh, ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in the famous case of Loving versus Virginia. So this case was also challenged. It went to a federal, uh, I'm sorry, this, this uh, ordinance, um, anti-miscegenation or, ordinance was uh, challenged in federal court. Federal court uh, struck it down based on a violation of the 14th Amendment. And it went up to the US Supreme Court and without a written opinion, the US Supreme Court sustained the uh, decision of the federal uh, appeals court and struck down this, this uh, segregation ordinance. Let's turn now to what is more commonly understood as the origins of American zoning, which basically in this reading uh, began in the 1920s after these racial zoning ordinances had already appeared. As we've seen, uh, zoning originally had the purpose of segregating races in Virginia, but it got a reboot in the 1920s by an odd coalition of social reformers, business interests, and Herbert Hoover's Commerce Department. You can see on this uh, copy of the Standard State Zoning Enabling Act, he'd also enlisted the help of Frederick Law Olmsted, who was a very prominent uh, landscape architect, most well known probably for designing Central Park in New York City. So the Zoning Enabling Act became the basis of most state zoning laws throughout the country in the 20s. The primer, the zoning primer, uh, also was published by the Commerce Department at the same time and includes what I, I read as sort of an ironic statement. You can see the quote there, but these differing regulations are the same for all districts of the same type. They treat all men alike. <laughs> 
This was the same justification that was made by the Richmond city attorney when they were defending the segregation ordinance, claiming that it applied equally to both quote, colored and white citizens. I wanna to talk to you for a little bit about the Supreme Court case of Euclid versus Ambler Realty for a couple of reasons. First, it is the landmark case that established local government's authority to use zoning to separate uses and densities. Second, it reinforces our thesis that a primary, in fact, maybe the primary purpose of zoning is to protect residential property values from perceived threats, threats of new Americans, threats of industrial encroachment, et cetera. And this case is so important that when we talk about zoning um, that separates uses and densities, we actually refer to it as Euclidean zoning. You, you may have heard that term. And it's called Euclidean zoning, not because it was named after the ancient Greek mathematician and Euclidean geometry, but after the village of Euclid, which was, is a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio. Euclid was afraid of encroaching industry and commercial development moving west from Cleveland. So the town uh, leaders or village leaders adopted a zoning ordinance in this map that I've got up on the screen. Ambler Realty owned property that became restricted by this new zoning ordinance and sued in federal court. They claimed that it violated the 14th Amendment by depriving the owners of liberty and property without due process of law and denying them the equal protection of law. Ambler Realty won in the lower court, uh, in the U.S. District Court, and frankly was expected to win at the U.S. Supreme Court. And the decision was somewhat surprising, particularly to, to certain business interests. And it focused, of course, on whether the zoning map and the zoning ordinance violated the 14th Amendment. Interestingly, in the written opinion, they first acknowledged that the separation of industrial uses, business uses from residential, was justified as a necessary exercise of police powers to protect the general welfare, almost as a, a given, um, essentially acknowledging that their jurisprudence, the Supreme Court's prior decisions, particularly using the law of nuisance, recognized that governments have the ability to separate these types of uses. The question, and you can see this quote um, on the slide, this question involves the validity of what is really the crux of the more recent zoning legislation, namely the creation and maintenance of residential districts from which business and trade of every sort, including hotels, and I've highlighted apartment houses, are excluded. And there's a very famous quote, <clears throat> some of you may have heard about in this same decision, where the court says that very often the apartment house is a mere parasite constructed in order to take advantage of the open spaces and attractive surroundings created by the residential character of the district. So the justification of using the police power that the Supreme Court decided was that apartment houses, what we were think of as higher density zoning, um, was essentially a threat to other types of homes. Um, and this was an expression of that perceived threat, which we see come up frequently um, throughout um, zoning history uh, in the 20th and 21st century. Once the constitutionality of the Euclid zoning or the Euclidean zoning was established, local governments began using their new tools of comprehensive planning and zoning for a variety of purposes. Some of these purposes were for civic improvement and orderly development, the kinds of sort of progressive values that I think a lot of us thought zoning was created to do. But in many cases, the purpose of these zoning ordinances was also including racial segregation. And the next era, essentially from the Euclid v. Ambler decision up until the Fair Housing Act uh, of 1967, is what I really would like to characterize as racially informed planning and zoning. The city of Roanoke provides a good example of 
the use particularly of comprehensive planning to segregate. The city hired prestigious city planner, John Nolan, who was a landscape architect and a protege of Frederick Law Olmsted, a um, Wharton graduate, uh, Harvard Business, or I'm sorry, Harvard uh, Planning School, Architecture School graduate. And he prepared a city plan for Roanoke. If you look at the map on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that he mapped a fairly considerable zone for, quote, Negro residents. Now, not surprisingly, the plan designates segregated schools for this area and directs the planned city facilities, the new improvements that this was all about, for areas that were, of course, distant from the areas of, quote, colored population. Another common technique in the zoning laws of this era was to zone African-American neighborhoods for industrial uses. And this is a map on the screen from a Virginia Supreme Court uh, case that was challenging residential zoning in the city of Alexandria in, uh, in, the, in the 1930s. At that, uh, the trial for this case, testimony was offered that the subject land was best suited for industrial zoning because there has never been, and this is a quote, there has never been any real residential development in its immediate vicinity. Despite the fact that the same witness described a quote, colored settlement immediately adjacent to the property. This map from the same era is from the Works Progress Administration um, low-income housing survey, which was part of the uh, New Deal programs. And uh, historian Kristen Moon provided this uh, to me um, with, along with some data that the WPA had put together that shows a block-by-block -block distribution of Black households in Alexandria. Christian wrote an excellent article on African-American housing uh, in Alexandria from the 1930s to the 1960s and has quite a body of scholarship on these issues I certainly would, would commend to you. Using the WPA survey data, we cross-reference this against the contemporaneous zoning maps in Alexandria and found that industrial zoning initially was applied to approximately 100 homes, the majority of which were African-American, even though only 20% of the population in the city at the time were African-Americans. So not surprisingly, another example of how zoning was used indirectly to segregate and discriminate. It's beyond the scope of our particular study and analysis, but if you read the book, The Color of Law, you'll certainly uh, learn a whole range of government actions that segregated and devalued black housing in the 20th century. Redlining, FHA lending policies, racially restrictive covenants are just a few of those techniques. In addition, urban renewal uh, with the use of condemnation of African-American neighborhoods and highway construction also had a devastating impact on stable African-American neighborhoods in many Virginia jurisdictions. Let's turn now to the current era following the Fair Housing Act of, of 1968. Government action with the intent of discriminating against racial minorities uh, has been outlawed and very few civic leaders or electeds would now support racial segregation in any form. And yet the evidence shows our neighborhoods remain largely segregated. Now, why is that? Many studies have shown that the legacy of institutional racism is embodied in economic segregation of our zoning laws today. This uh, <clears throat> slide is a, a great image that the DC Office of Planning put together that helps describe the different types of density that our zoning ordinances tends to separate. And you can see on the left-hand side of the image, the uh, detached single family homes being the lowest density and moving upwards from, to the, the duplex type of homes, row homes or townhouses as we call them, walk up apartments, increasing density through mid-rise apartments and high-rise apartments. 
And this is a good visual depiction of those levels of density that, that are um, separated, of course, in our current zoning ordinances. They not only separate these densities, but they also separate economically. In this study uh, from uh, 2010, uh, Rothwell and Massey found a strong relationship between density zoning and income segregation. And uh, reading through their social science jargon, they basically say that density zoning causes income segregation. And this is not surprising. When you, you look at our own backyard here in Fairfax County, uh, you can see that it is much more expensive <clears throat> to buy or rent a single family home than a townhouse. Uh, and then certainly that's more expensive than buying or renting an apartment or a condominium. And these are 2020 average home prices showing that spread. I've also shown on the slide the zoning map, the current zoning map for Fairfax County. And if you do a GIS analysis, you'll find that 79% of Fairfax County is currently zoned for single family residential neighborhoods. Now, I'm not very good at math and I'm probably off by a little bit, but I think the major message here is that uh, roughly half of the households in Fairfax County with average uh, or below um, household incomes simply can't afford to live in 79% of the land area of the county. Now we know from lots of demographic data that our neighborhoods remain very segregated racially. I'll mention uh, the Northern Virginia Community Foundation has uh, done a, a new study, a data analysis that they're about to release, which shows how we remain uh, very much segregated racially and how this affects uh, social mobility uh, throughout Northern Virginia. And this slide here, which actually comes from uh, California, this graph from the San Francisco area shows the correlation between the percentage of single family zoning in a jurisdiction and race composition. And I think we're going to find that as you look into the demographic data, there are similar, um, although ungraphed, uh, data points here in Northern Virginia. And these graphs that I put up on the slide really tell the story of why income segregation translates to racial segregation. This is current uh, 2020 data for Virginia median family income. You can see at the top of the slide, the red line is the average or rather median Asian family income up above $120,000 a year. And then if you go down the average white family income here, just shy of $100,000. But when you look at the uh, black average or rather median family income, it's down well below the other <clears throat> uh, different uh, median family income. And the, and the gap is even more pronounced, and this is particularly relevant to housing opportunities. When you look at median net worth, really a rather stunning difference between the median net worth of white families and black families. And this has been a gap that has been prevalent for decades and has sustained or grown in, in recent, um, recent times. Even the Federal Reserve Bank has concluded in, in, in their very recent um, uh, publication on the disparities in wealth by race and, and, and ethnicity, they have concluded that the ability to own a home depends largely on family wealth, which has been suppressed by government action for certain racial minorities for more than a century. Another study by Rothwell and Massey puts it plainly, zoning laws cause racial segregation. Now I'm going to conclude my history of Virginia zoning uh, 
with this important Supreme Court decision from 1977, um, just shortly after the adoption of the Fair Housing Act uh, in 1968. And in this case, which went to the US Supreme Court, uh, the village of Arlington Heights had a, um, a, a case brought against it for denying apartment rezoning. It was really set up, I think, by various advocates for uh, affordable housing. And the case challenged the denial of that apartment rezoning based on the discriminatory effect of denying this higher density housing. And the holding of the court was that unless the denial of a rezoning request was driven by discriminatory intent, it is not unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment in the US Constitution. Official action will not be held unconstitutional solely because it results in a racially disproportionate impact. I, I grabbed this photograph from the uh, Village of Arlington Heights uh, website just a few days ago. And as you can imagine, uh, just looking at the photograph, if you look at the demographic data for the Village of Arlington Heights, um, the, the very much predominantly white suburb of Chicago has remained the same over these years since that 1977 decision. So having talked about the history, let's uh, do a, a kind of a quick look ahead to potential remedies that our group is beginning to study and to, to look at. So among the different topics that we are researching and very much uh, looking for, for comments and interest and, and feedback, first is the possibility of amendments to the comprehensive plan enabling legislation. And we've looked at a variety of different types of uh, changes, but one that seems very obvious to, to us is that it would be a very effective to just start requiring localities to begin measuring racial segregation in their ordinances. Those things which we don't measure, how can we possibly hope to change? So that's just one example of the types of changes to uh, comp plan enabling legislation that we're looking at. Certainly there's a role for inclusionary zoning requirements that require a diversity of market rate housing types. Uh, we think that requirements for income restricted housing and contributions to affordable housing trust fund have a role as well. Those have become fairly um, predominant here in Northern Virginia. We think that changes to single family zoning, although politically difficult, uh, are necessary to increase housing diversity. And there's been some um, preliminary activity in trying, for example, to increase the opportunities for accessory dwelling units in certain jurisdictions. We're looking at innovative approaches to try to increase home ownership in particular. So many of the programs are focused on rental housing. And as we know, the, the, the real opportunities for social mo mobility comes through building wealth, uh, which happens predominantly in the US through home ownership. We're looking at the restrictions on private covenants, not racial covenants, but covenants that mandate certain minimum um, house sizes, for example, that, that have an effect that um, through economic segregation has uh, effects of racial segregation. And probably the most important thing that, that we need to all study are ways of educating, educating the electorate on why this is an issue and why they shouldn't fear changes to um, zoning laws um, as we move forward. So we believe um, that those of us who are involved in the apparatus of planning and zoning have an obligation to use our knowledge to ex excise the legacy of 20th century racism and that Primary reforms should be focused on increasing housing opportunities for all people throughout Virginia. Most of this can be accomplished by changing zoning and planning laws to allow more housing choices. And appropriate reform can occur without diminishing local government's power to plan and zone. Decades of experience with mixed use and mixed density zoning show that housing opportunities can be increased without reducing property values and established neighborhoods.
I sincerely hope that you will come to the same conclusion that we have, that reform must occur, and that you will help us in the formulation of proposals to accomplish this. So thank you very much for your attention and really look forward to your feedback. All right, thank you very much, Jonathan. And as you pointed out, education is one of your recommendations and we at George Mason University are pleased to partner with you. Uh, this is hopefully the first step in our contribution to the educational effort. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce um, Anne Magro, the co-director of the Business for a Better World Center. Thanks, Eric, and thank you, Jonathan. That was really fascinating. And what I think is really important is, is where you left us, right? Not just on a history and an understanding of how we got to where we are today, but thinking about next steps and how do we correct it. So I'll be really looking forward to seeing the next part of the report and, and the next webinar that we can do together. It's my pleasure to introduce our, the members of our reaction panel. We have Emily Hamilton. Emily is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center and the director of the Urbanity Project there. Her research focuses on urban economics and land use policy. And we have Tracy Boehner, who's a Senior Vice President for Infrastructure and Economic Development and Government Relations Services with McGuire Woods Consulting. Uh, she represents private sector clients in the areas of transportation planning, funding and policy, public-private partnership and innovative procurement, education policy, technology policy, and land use and economic development and procurement before state and local governments. So each of our panelists will have 10 minutes uh, to respond, and then we will go to the Q&A period. Thank you. Emily, you can go ahead and start. Thanks a lot, Anne, and thank you to uh, Jonathan and your colleagues at McGuire Woods for providing such an interesting uh, report to discuss this evening. Oops. I'll be focusing my uh, comments largely on that, that going forward piece, uh, where we are today in terms of the effects of um, current land use restrictions on housing affordability and racial justice, as well as some of the current reform efforts and how those efforts uh, might be more effective going forward. A lot of the focus on reforming um, the, the history of economic and racial segregation of U.S. land use policies has focused in on single family zoning and for many good reasons. As Jonathan pointed out, this is, is one of the key tools that localities have used to segregate cities and neighborhoods by income directly and by race less directly. And the federal government has also played a really important part in the adoption of single family zoning as the FHA encouraged lenders to only lend to white home buyers in uh, neighborhoods that were zoned for single family development exclusively with racial deed restrictions in place in many cases. So there's been a very direct government role in the development of exclusively single family neighborhoods and the effect that this development has had on racial segregation and opportunities for wealth building for families of color. Uh, and I'll um, turn secondly to missing middle housing uh, that, that Jonathan mentioned briefly as a potential reform to single family zoning that has dominated so much U.S. planning. And finally, the widespread economic benefits of, of that these reforms potentially present um, for households of, of color in particular and for the country as a whole. In 2019, Minneapolis made headlines uh, across the country for becoming the first city that had single family zoning to replace this single family zoning with triplex zoning across the whole city, creating the opportunity for home builders to come in and redevelop or convert existing single family houses into two or three units, um, potentially creating the opportunity for lower cost housing relative to single family development and, um, and for, for better 
um, racial integration as a result. And we've seen a lot of action on single family zoning at the state level as well. Also in 2019, Oregon lawmakers passed a bill that preempts single family zoning across much of the state, requiring localities to permit duplexes and in some cases fourplexes where only a single family house would have been allowed previously. And Oregon remains the only state that has, has passed a law like this, but policymakers in uh, several other states, as you can see in the, the yellow states on this map, have introduced bills that would have similar effects in limiting single family zoning across uh, whole states at a time. I'll, I'll talk now a little bit more about the, the details of what makes this missing middle construction that policymakers at the local and state levels are going for with these uh, reforms to single family zoning, as well as some of the obstacles that the, the narrow focus on single family zoning exclusively presents. These two structures are a duplex and a triplex from Minneapolis uh, that were built before Minneapolis had any zoning at all. Uh, these were, were pre-zoning um, structures that are a, a remaining duplex and triplex today. But even though Minneapolis has reformed single family zoning with the intention of legalizing this type of housing, these two structures don't comply with uh, current zoning because they're too tall, they're too big, and they're too close to their lot lines. So it's not just single family zoning that's standing in the way of, of missing middle construction and um, lower cost types of housing that would facilitate better economic and racial integration today, but a whole suite of, of restrictions on how much and what type of housing can be built that policymakers at the local level have implemented. This is a, another type of, of housing, um, of missing middle housing, townhouses in Houston, that I'd like to contrast with the Minneapolis triplex reforms. In the 90s, Houston policymakers reformed their minimum lot size requirements from 5,000 square feet down to 1,400. So in effect, this has a similar effect as the, the Minneapolis reform, allowing three units, in Houston's case, townhouses, to be built where, um, where only one house would have been permitted previously. But if we look at the, the Minneapolis case, current triplex zoning allows for three units that are about a thousand square feet each on a, a typical city lot to be built in, in um, place of a previous single family house. But in Houston, uh, these townhouses can be about 2,000 square feet or even more in some cases, uh, three of them on what was a, a similar size lot um, in, in Houston. So we, we see a much more flexible type of missing middle housing in Houston where there's, there's an opportunity to build more space for housing in addition to more units. And um, the, the Houston reform has resulted in tens of thousands of these um, townhouses being built across the city. Whereas the Minneapolis reform, although still very new, has had quite disappointing results so far in actually resulting in permitting new duplex and triplex structures. I'll turn to, to one other example of a successful um, missing middle zoning from a jurisdiction that I think is, is really interesting, which is Palisades Park, New Jersey, right across the Hudson River from Manhattan. Now, Palisades Park, in, in contrast to the vast majority of localities in the U.S., um, never adopted single-family zoning. So it, it went against the grain of um, the, the FHA and federal government, which was encouraging localities 
to adopt this lower type of um, density zoning. And Palisades Park instead adopted one and two family zoning across the vast majority of its land. Now, in spite of its two family zoning, Palisades Park was built out almost entirely as detached single family homes, like this one that you can see here that was built in probably the 50s or 60s. But as prices in the New York City region have gotten much higher, Palisades Park has seen tons of duplex redevelopment because its flexibility of land use laws has permitted that gradual infill development. Uh, and these duplexes provide typically more space on each side than the single family house that they're replacing. And they provide another example of how zoning that facilitates the type of housing that might be in a locality today will need more than just reform from single family zoning to permitting more units, but will also need to allow more space to be built uh, in order to successfully encourage redevelopment um, to provide that new housing supply and improve affordability. And I'll, I'll wrap up with some of the, the widespread economic benefits that are a, a potential outcome of zoning reform. Certainly households, um, African American and Latin households have been disproportionately harmed by the history of, of US um, land use regulation and mortgage lending policy. But these rules that were initially implemented to segregate our neighborhoods and cities are having vast economic consequences on all types of, of households today. In a, a well-functioning housing market, there's a process called filtering. And I love using uh, this, this picture of hermit crabs to illustrate this process. As housing prices rise in a locality because there's increasing demand for housing, New housing uh, will be built if it's allowed to, uh, that will typically be larger, a little bit fancier, a little bit more expensive than the housing that's already available in that locality and will provide a, a new home for a uh, relatively high income household that's already in that locality or who wants to move into that locality. And then that sets off a chain reaction of households uh, being able to move into somewhat better housing that's a better fit for them, freeing up uh, lower cost housing at the opposite end of the, the income spectrum. And these hermit crabs provide an, an illustration of how this process unfolds. Because when a hermit crab outgrows its shell, it will wait on the beach for another crab to come along in a slightly bigger shell uh, in order to make this, this mass uh, migration that we see here feasible, um, providing a new home for all, all of these um, crabs with of various sizes, or we could think of them as having various income levels. But single family zoning in conjunction with other land use regulations prevents this filtering process from happening. It keeps a, a stagnant supply of housing in place. And as, as demand for housing increases in a location where supply is stagnant, prices just go up. And, and rather than being able to find um, somewhere to live, the, the lowest income households face very severe consequences of um, being housing costs burdened, having to move to a, a new location or a, a farther flung place in their region. Um, and in the most tragic cases, even homelessness. And because of the, um, in large part, because of the history of housing policies that have um, harmed African American and Latin households, they um, they disproportionately bear the burden of this problem. The effects of zoning have become a, a, a big topic in macroeconomics in recent years because they play such a large role in shaping 
where people can live and as a result, what economic opportunities are available to them. One study finds that about half of the reduction in income mobility that we saw between 1990 and 2010 could be explained by land use regulations that are causing people to move not to where their best economic opportunities may be located, but to move instead to where they can access housing that fits within their household budgets. So we see people increasingly moving not to the highest income places in the country, as we saw for um, most of the country's history up until the past few decades, but rather we see people moving in large numbers to where housing is more affordable. And uh, again, it's it's households of color and, and individuals of color who who bear the the greatest loss of opportunities that come about because of these land use restrictions but it's also the country as a whole another um, very influential macroeconomic study from uh, the past couple of years found that the average american worker is earning four thousand dollars less annually because of this uh, problem where people are not moving to their best opportunities, but are instead moving toward lower cost places. Uh, I'll leave it there. Very much um, looking forward to Tracy's comments. And again, uh, thank you to Jonathan and your, your colleagues at McGuire Woods for providing such an interesting report for discussion. Thank you, Emily. Really appreciate your comments there. Okay, we're going to turn it over to Tracy now, who uh, will also have about 10 minutes, and then we'll move into the Q&A. Oh, thank you, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'm going to wrap this up a little quicker because I, there's been some great questions and comments, and I want to get to them. But I want to follow up on what Emily and Jonathan have put before us, and it is we have to embrace what has happened and focus on what we need to do to improve it. I, would, I ask you all to go back to your communities and take a look at what has happened in your communities. Define the impact of what zoning has done for economic attainment, for education attainment, for health, for health outcomes. Policy changes are going to be hard. We, we all know that. Um, but we collectively have got to talk uh, about what happened in specifics and then talk about the specifics of what we wanna change and why. The transparency of that is gonna be so critical to overcoming what some of us have called the red herrings of opposition. Too much traffic, schools will be too, too full, my property values will go down. Every one of those and every other one we're gonna hear needs to be debunked, needs to be proven as untrue, and sometimes, let's face it, it's gonna to need to be ignored. Um, you know, generational wealth, uh, stable families, education and home ownership are the foundation of that. And all of the discussions we've, we're having today and Emily's and Jonathan's presentations are showing how that, you know, isn't happening for too many of our neighbors. Also, as we're moving forward, you know, understanding that the solutions or improvements or fixes are not all about land use. There are some very critical things about access to capital. I'm going to come back again to education because it is a great tool and leveler. Um, you know, advocate for Virginia tax reform that'll provide particularly local government with the authority and funding and tools to address these issues. Uh, greater access to both um, individual and family financing options, but also for entrepreneurship. Uh, remove these unexplained examples where we keep hearing about, about housing appraisals, which limit equity for minority homeowners. Uh, and I, I wanna, you know, and again, preserve and, and advance and expand affordable housing options throughout your community. Market rate or subsidize ownership and rental for broad age groups. And I, I, I wanna leave you with this. Um, we we'll, should ask our elected leaders at all level. We've got a lot of elections coming up this year in Virginia. 
you know, ask them, have they thought about this issue? Um, is this part of their platform? What are they going to do to address these issues? To just make sure that everyone in our community has access to housing that they can afford, that if they want to have equity from that housing, that they can, they can get it. Um, and get rid of this gap of the missing middle and fix that. So, Eric, I'm going to leave it at that because I really want to get to the discussion from the attendees. Okay, well, thank you, Jonathan, Emily, and Tracy. And now we'll get to some of the questions. So if, if Jonathan, Tracy, and, and Emily just turn on their, their videos, I will start with a question about homeowners associations. Uh, so Jonathan, you had mentioned private covenants. Can you talk more about that and specifically the role of HOAs? And sometimes HOA regulations are even stronger than, than zoning uh, limitations. How do we go about addressing that issue to diversify our housing stock? Yeah, Eric, thank you. I think it's a, a really um, important question because what we've seen is that you can relax some of the zoning regulations on development of types of housing, but if covenants have been recorded and put in place, HOAs and, 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 and their declarations are in place, that that may not allow the types of new housing that you would like to have happen. So it's certainly important. I think that there are ways in looking at Virginia's um, Common Interest Association Acts um, to make sure that the uh, restrictions that a, a property owners association or, or HOA put in place are really targeted to issues that they ought to be regulating and not expanding beyond that scope. So. That's one of the areas where we're eager to hear thoughts, particularly from people who are expert in that area. Uh, the next question maybe for Tracy. Um, I note your topics don't include school boundaries, which are defined by geography and which sometimes are a big part of the housing discussion. So can you address that? Uh, don't most uh, boundar school boundaries that are you know, defined by geography further codify income inequality and segregation of neighborhoods? Uh, certainly if you equate the location of the school is located in certain neighborhoods and that, 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 that determines the quality of that school, absolutely. Um, you know, we historically, there, there were busing programs that were supposed to get around that. You know, this big tug of war between neighborhood schools and having kids have access to all schools. Again, this is one of those areas where addressing the problems created by segregated zoning have to be fixed by something that might not be about land use. And that is focusing on quality access, all educational opportunities um, from K-12 through your lifetime. So that means higher ed. So that the, you know, your community has to address, you know, what access all children have to anything they might need whether it's AP or lab work or tutors. So yeah, the school districts will, lines will perpetuate the racially you know, segregated zoning, but that can be overcome by something that's not related to zoning. Thank you, Trace. So it's probably for Emily. Um, there's a question that here does uh, about factory built housing or the new uh, modular uh, built housing. Would building code changes to allow factory built housing be a remedy for more affordable uh, housing? Certainly, that's an area where um, we've, we've seen a disappointing amount of, of innovation over time. Houses, for the most part today, are built in a very similar way to the way they were built 100 years ago. And there are many opportunities to improve and lower the cost of that process. Uh, Jonathan mentioned accessory dwelling units as a, a potential area of reform to create lower cost housing options in single family neighborhoods and uh, modular or prefabricated units I think are certainly going to, to be a part in accessory dwelling units becoming a widespread and affordable option for homeowners to invest in. Thank you. Uh, this is, next question is, is probably for either Jonathan or Tracy. Uh, so there's a question here regarding um, 
defined or I guess uh, open space and green space uh, delineation. The question is specifically about Prince William County uh, as with respect to its rural crescent, but I guess it applies to a lot of a lot of jurisdictions, you know, Loudoun, Fairfax, and a lot of our jurisdictions around here have the same kind of sort of green area. Uh, do you think that this contributes to uh, housing segregation uh, with respect to uh, segregating big parts of the uh, of, of these counties with large lots and more expensive housing uh, for uh, in those lots, but like. Uh, more expensive and also less uh, racially segregated communities. I can take a shot at this one, Tracy, if you'd like. Um, fortunately, I don't do work in Prince William County, uh, so so my my comments won't come back to me. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I think quite obviously when you set off these large swaths of land area in a jurisdiction from development, although. There's certainly environmental and, and other values that are being um, addressed by that. You have to recognize that it has an impact on constraining the supply of housing um, within that, that area. I think that there are potential development patterns. Um, Loudon did a little bit of experimentation with this in the past where you can uh, concentrate development within some of those more rural landscapes and try to preserve some of those environmental values while still balancing it with an increase in housing opportunities. But it's clearly a big issue that we have to deal with. And I'll, I'll add something else. If, you, if your rural crescent or your rural area is one where you're trying to, to encourage agribusiness, you are absolutely limiting the ability of those businesses to attract and retain a workforce because they can't afford to live there. Um, so you do have to, again, this is where you go back and figure out, okay, what am I actually trying to accomplish? Because if you're, try if you're preserving all of that for a variety of reasons, some of, you know, all good, but if one of them is to say, I want to encourage agriculturally based businesses, what are you telling someone who may want to work in that business because they can't find a place to live because it's too expensive? The next question is, is for Emily, um, has to do with gentrification. So what role do you think gentrification plays in areas that are, that are currently, uh, you know, where black Americans live? Um, you know, urban renewal and the increasing cost of living uh, kind of impact uh, those communities when, you know, they quote unquote gentrify and new housing is put into place sort of, uh, to sort of the existing community gets dislocated instead of housing created for them. Certainly, this is a, a pattern that we've seen um, in DC, perhaps more than in any other city in the country. And what we see is that the historically white, most expensive parts of the city have retained the um, largely the housing stock and the land use policies that were originally implemented to shape the type of development that went there. But other uh, lower income, um, largely African American parts of the city have had less power to uh, maintain the land use regulations in their neighborhoods over time. So we've seen really uh, rapid fire development that's unfortunately been accompanied with displacement in neighborhoods like Columbia Heights or the H Street corridor that some of you may be familiar with in DC. Um, the best remedy for that, uh, as I see it, is to open up not just the, the least politically powerful parts of a city to development, but the city and region as a whole. So making development um, feasible in those um, majority white highest income parts of the city um, so that the least empowered parts of the city don't, um, don't bear the burden of um, too much development, if you will, um, and, and rather seeing permitting um, more gradual changes across the, an entire city and region over time. Thank you, Emily. Um, next question is uh, probably for Jonathan. Have you looked at the ways in which tax revenue, property tax revenue, 
incentivizes jurisdictions to favor certain types of housing, I guess, more expensive housing, uh, because they generate more tax revenue. Yeah, I think a lot of the um, decisions on zoning are driven by fiscal impact. Um, sometimes those can motivate um, higher density uh, development in some cases, particularly if it's mixed use development that comes along with some commercial to generate more tax revenue from it. But there is um, certainly an inclination, I think, by a lot of local governments, uh, once they have, quote, stable residential neighborhoods, to uh, leave them that way and to just continue to um, uh, basically accrue the, the rising assessments um, from those uh, single family neighborhoods. And Eric, Mr. I, oh, go ahead, Tracy. No, I will say this is where tax reform comes in. Virginia's local governments are far too dependent on real property taxes for revenue. Um, it's, it's hard to blame them if they're trying to maximize land values because that is the most, that's the biggest, you know, it's a huge part of, of their revenue to support all the other services that, that citizens want. Um, and, and I think that's, a, that's probably Virginia's, one of Virginia's biggest challenges really is, try, is just a, addressing that tax reform item and how that impacts local government's ability to collect the revenue they need, but not be so dependent on one revenue source. The uh, next uh, question is probably for Tracy. Could offering or expanding public transportation to make accessibility for work and play areas uh, contribute to more integration in our neighborhoods? Yes. Uh, I mean, Transportation access, particularly public transportation access, should always be focused first on those who need it most. If that's households who can't afford more than one car or any car at all, definitely go forward. Because again, they need access to education, healthcare, and, and job opportunities. And that's gonna help them you know, earn wealth. But um, I think that's, that is another part of the challenge. And I think the region um, is starting to have a better discussion and look at public transportation, what that means. I think what our challenge has been is looking beyond what we traditionally look at, you know, heavy rail, buses, you know, large buses, and realize that we probably need something a lot more flexible. So, you know, not so many point A to point B bus systems, but maybe some that are a little more flexible, ones that are last mile, one that come, ones that come on demand because the, the workplace, the work hour, the work environment has changed a lot. So we, we're gonna have to completely rethink how we do public transportation, totally agree. Okay, and for Jonathan, uh, the panel is, seems to be saying that, you know, property owners, single family owners shouldn't fear changes in zoning regulations. The reality is they do fear changes, which they see as potentially re uh, reducing the property value of their homes, or worse, enabling others to live in their neighborhood. You know, how will education address this, or and, and what specific forms will this take? You think? It's a great question, Eric. That's one of the first questions my mother asked me when she read our study and said, "Well, how are you going to do any of this stuff without affecting our neighborhoods?" Um, and I, I guess the answer is we, we can't really achieve true reform without affecting our neighborhoods. But I think what we can do is address some of the specific concerns. For example, reduction of housing values. I think that the data would indicate or does indicate that having more density nearby doesn't necessarily reduce your housing values. Um, in fact, if you look at, at some of the um, neighborhoods in the proximity of Tyson's Corner where I am today, you'll find that the increased density and in development which has occurred at Tyson's has actually driven up uh, property values nearby. So it's those sorts of very targeted, um, thoughtful responses to what's underpinning the fears against this change that I think we need to provide and to help our elected officials with, uh, with those tools. All right, um, we're coming up to uh, 6.15, um, and I, I really apologize. There are over 50 questions left 
uh, in the question pipeline. But uh, and, and I apologize to the questionnaire uh, to the people asking the questions. If you feel free to email me the questions, I will forward them to Jonathan and Tracy and the Maguire Woods team. Uh, as they mentioned, this is part of their um, uh, trying to get feedback from from the community. Uh, but we're just completely out of time and trying to finish uh, on time for, for you know as, as we as we promised. So I, I thank uh, Jonathan, Emily, and and Tracy for uh, joining us today. And um, I just want to announce a couple of uh, upcoming webinars that uh, this audience might be interested in. And again, we, we still have also a, a video that we're going to play about um, Arlington County. So if you're interested, we have upcoming webinars on inclusive ownership of neighborhood retail on May 19th, uh, Building Tall with Mass Timber Technology on May 27th, and relevant to this conversation, uh, uh, a webinar on June 23rd called Making Room for More Housing, uh, a case study on the Los Angeles uh, accessory dwelling boom. So watch out for emails from us about those. If you want to uh, get a registration, please feel free to email me directly. If not, we will be sending out uh, emails uh, about these events uh, to the people registered today. And now I turn the uh, mic over to Anne and Lisa. Perfect. Um, so we just want to thank you for participating in this evening's webinar, A History of Zoning and Segregation in Virginia, Lesson Lessons for Today, um, co-hosted by the Business for a Better World Center and the Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship um, of the George Mason University School of Business and in collaboration with McGuire Woods. Special thanks to Jonathan Rock, Tracy Baynard, and Emily Hamilton. We now have the pleasure of viewing an impressive video entitled Race and Housing in Arlington, which is really a fitting capstone to this evening's event. A special thank you to Michelle Winters and the Alliance for Housing Solutions for allowing us to share the video they produced. So May, if you're ready, you can go ahead and play the video. African Americans have lived in Arlington for generations. Their stories are unique, but the forces that shape their lives and communities are mirrored in the practices of segregation all across the nation. Some of Arlington's earliest African-American landowners were the Syfax family, which lived on the Arlington House property in the early 1800s, and the Jones family, settling in Green Valley in 1844. During the Civil War, the federal government established Freedman's Village as Arlington's first planned community. It thrived until 1900 before the federal government closed it to create Arlington Cemetery. Many residents relocated to the nearby settlement of Queen City. Halls Hill in North Arlington began in 1881 when Basil Hall began selling land to former slaves. By 1900, 38% of Arlington residents were black, living in 12 settlements throughout the county. As Arlington grew in the first half of the 20th century, most of these black communities were pushed aside in favor of white suburban development. New suburban communities were being built at a rapid pace, both single family homes and garden apartments, but they were not available to African-American residents. One tool frequently used in Arlington and other communities was a deed restriction, usually put in place at the time a home was built limiting the home's use to members of the Caucasian race. In the 1930s, the residents of the whites-only Faustoria and Waycroft neighborhoods built a seven-foot-tall cinder block wall separating themselves from Halls Hill, cutting off most access points to the established Black community. This kind of wall would have been helpful for obtaining financing from the Federal Housing Administration, which at the time viewed different racial groups to be inharmonious. In 
around the same time, communities around the nation begin to put in place a new kind of land use regulation known as zoning. By 1938, the county had used this tool to ban row houses, which were primarily used by African Americans. Though this style provided housing opportunities for many people and was common in Washington, D.C. and Alexandria, it was viewed as distasteful in Arlington. Building the Pentagon in the 1940s struck another blow at Arlington's black community when residents of Queen City and East Arlington were evicted to make way for the building's road network. Many eventually settled in Green Valley. By mid-century, only three African-American neighborhoods remained in Arlington. Because of their long history and stable population, home ownership in these areas was common. But these were the only areas within the county where Blacks could live. During the Civil Rights era, physical and legal walls began to crumble. School desegregation came first, but open and fair housing laws would take another 10 years to achieve. In 1965, a group of 2,500 volunteers in Northern Virginia conducted the most extensive fair housing campaign the United States had seen, collecting 45,000 signatures by going door to door. Then, in the wake of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, Congress finally passed the Fair Housing Act of 1968. When it came to renting, buying, or financing housing, it would no longer be legal to discriminate on the basis of race. Two months later, Arlington County became the first jurisdiction in Virginia to pass a local fair housing ordinance with a vote of three to two. The meeting was briefly disrupted by a member of the American Nazi Party, which was headquartered in Boston. The following year, Arlington's ban on row houses was removed from zoning policy. Much has changed in the 50 years since. Arlington has become home to a population of immigrants from around the globe. But despite these changes, most areas of Arlington have remained the same as they were when they were built during the days of Jim Crow and legal segregation. In fact, in many ways, zoning rules that govern Arlington's low-density residential areas have become more restrictive over time, while only a small part of the county's land was made available to meet the growing housing needs of the area. Today, many residents of Arlington's historically Black neighborhoods have aging homes that often don't comply with zoning laws that were put in place after they were built. The squeeze of outdated zoning, gentrification, rising housing prices, and lack of options have forced many of Arlington's Black residents to leave. Now Arlington, like the nation, is taking a hard look at its past. It's time to ask ourselves, if we are ready to dismantle the walls of indifference once and for all and build in Arlington where people of all all walks of life are welcome and can afford to live. That concludes our webinar this evening. Thank you very much for all our participants. And please watch out for an email tomorrow with a link to the video and the, the materials that were discussed this uh, evening. So again, thank you very much. On behalf of George Mason University, our partners at McGuire Woods, we look forward to seeing you at a future George Mason real estate education event. Have a good evening.